Welcome to this interview, which is part of the Kansas Oral History Project. Uh, that is a 501c3 organization. Uh, it is a project uh, designed to bring interviews with notable Kansans who have made great contributions to the success of the state of Kansas. And uh, this is, uh, funding for this uh, series of projects is provided by Humanities Kansas, which is also a 501c3 uh, organization. And I'm very pleased today uh, to be able to interview Dr. Howard Schwartz, who is a long-term uh, uh, employee of the state of Kansas, most notably a 32-year judicial administrator for the Kansas Supreme Court, which uh, is uh, quite something to do anything for 32 years, but especially in a high-profile, very stressful, I'm sure, position. So we're very lucky to have Howard here today, and we're going to be interviewing about his, uh, his life, his experiences, uh, particularly with an emphasis on uh, uh, modernization and uh, all the things that happened to the uh, Kansas court system during his tenure that made it a much more efficient and well-run uh, uh, system. So, Howard, welcome. Uh, Thank so you. good of you to be subject to an interview uh, today. We'll try to keep this uh, pain-free as much as possible, but we do want to to get into your background, uh, particularly uh, uh, your origins on the East Coast, your migration to Kansas, and then your long tenure as a judicial administrator here in Kansas. So why don't we start by you talking about uh, growing up on the East Coast, uh, what it was like uh, in uh, Philadelphia where you grew up. Um, talk about uh, uh, growing up in Philadelphia, your family, and um, uh, your, a bit about your school experiences, and then we'll begin the migration okay. to Kansas. Okay. I grew up in Philadelphia. My parents owned a delicatessen, and I worked in the delicatessen for starting at around eight, nine years of age, and I feel that that really helped me during my whole lifespan, because one of the things I learned from the delicatessen was the customer is always right. And I, my, if they came in and argued with me, my mom would always say, don't argue with the customer, <laughs> customer's always right. And that has served me well working in the judicial system because I knew the judges were always right. <laughs> so I went to public school. I went to John Bartram and Overbrook High. In Overbrook, I met Will Chamberlain. And I used to play basketball. I was tall for my age then. And when Wilt came to Kansas, it struck up an interest in Kansas that it was a place that I wanted to go. And then as a senior in high school, I had the choice. I could go to college and work in the delicatessen, or I could leave the state and be free of the delicatessen at last. Well, most boys, uh, young boys, would think it was a, a real treat to work in a deli where you could have access to all kinds of goodies. Did you have free reign of uh, what was on offer? Our, my brother and I, I have a younger brother, what we would always say, slice a half, eat a quarter. Okay. So if people come in for a half pound of ham, we'd slice that half pound of ham, and we'd eat a quarter pound of the okay. ham. So, well, you worked uh, a lot when you were going to school. I mean, you yeah. had other jobs. I think, you, yeah. didn't you work for the Eagles? Yeah, uh, I worked for, sold programs for the Eagles. All right. Yeah, yeah, that was, a, that was a great job. I made five cents for every program I sold, and I would make $5, but I got to see the football games. And it was the year the Eagles won the national, it wasn't the Super Bowl then, but it was the, the world championship, or, and I got to see them. So, yeah, yeah. But it was kind of expected you work in the deli a lot, too. I had to work in the deli. And then my dad died when I was 16, and I really had to work in the deli. And, you know, my mom said that it would probably be best if I left town. And so she said, you can go to Kansas with Wilt because she knew I was a real big Wilt fan, or you can go to South Dakota. So I looked up. It was Yankton, South Dakota. So I looked it up in an encyclopedia, and there was a picture of snow, <laughs> a lot of snow. <laughs> I said, no, I don't think I want to go to South Dakota. I want to go to Kansas where Wilt is. All right. And, you know, I knew Wilt. So, but I couldn't get in KU because during that time they had a restriction that you had to start off at a state school, and then after a year at a state school, you could transfer to KU. But I liked Emporia so well. And then my brother came out, and he went to Emporia also. 
So, you know, my brother and I, we stayed together for all those years until I retired from here. And we've always lived in Emporia first and then Topeka secondarily. As I read through some of the materials about you, it appeared to me that two things were impo very important to you. One being basketball and the other being uh, religious activities that you yeah. were actively involved yeah. in both of yeah. those. You want to talk yeah. about a little bit yeah. about that? Well, I was raised Jewish and... Uh, I just, you know, it's something, uh, faith that I believe in. Uh, I was more culturally aligned maybe than religiously, but I was born on May 15th, the same day that Israel became a country. So I, there was just a natural affinity, and uh, it was something that I was always interested in. My parents were very religious people, and they contributed so much to Israel. Uh, so it was just a natural when we came here, I used to go to the temple in Topeka. And that was another thing that made me interested in Topeka. It was the only synagogue around. So my brother and I, we would come up for the different Jewish holidays to Topeka. We'd drive up from Emporia, come to Topeka. So, And I've been able to maintain my affiliation with the temple here all the years that I've been here. Now, in Emporia, Kansas, where you spent a good deal of your time, both, I think, as an undergraduate, and then you took some graduate studies yeah, there, too. and my master's there. Talk a little bit about the culture shock, particularly as it comes to food. I, I think there, there's a funny anecdote about you looking for some uh, typical deli food and not being able to find it in uh, Emporia, Kansas. It's true. All my life, we had lox and bagel on Sunday morning for breakfast. You know? And when I first got to Emporia, it was on a Saturday and so I slept in the dorm that Saturday night. Sunday morning, I got up and I decided to walk down Commercial Street looking for locks and bagel. And people had no idea what I was talking about. Was there anything now, open in Emporia? No, no there's, there were places <laughs> open, but no one had ever heard of bagels, let alone locks. And I always remember it was this one girl said to me, what planet are you from? Because I guess I had that real strong Eastern accent, which I still do. But... Another story is one time with the judges, we had a judges conference, and this was early on in, when I, in my administration with the court, and I ordered bagels, and nobody knew what, even the judges, they still were kind of not knowing. It wasn't w w widely known in Kansas what a bagel was, so. They said, where's the Wonder yeah, Bread, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so you found, if I recall correctly, some satisfaction in bonding with uh, with people uh, at Emporia. Talk yeah. about your experiences yeah. there. I think you joined a fraternity yes. and uh, with some people who'd yeah. uh, come from the East yeah. Coast, yeah. don't like you. Yeah. Uh, talk about your college experiences. Yeah. I, I, I loved Emporia. It was a humanistic school. They cared about you. Uh, I worked when I was at Emporia. I worked first in their cafeteria cleaning dishes, and then I joined a fraternity with Teak, Tall Kappa Epsilon, and when I was there, I, got, I made a connection with the country club in Emporia. And at that time, it was one of the best, I always to say it was one of the best paying jobs I ever had, because I would get paid, it was $25 a month, whether you spent your $25 there or didn't spend your $25 there. So people would come in and they'd have dinner, and at the end of the month, they'd still have $15, $20 left on their what they had to spend. And they'd always tip you whatever was left. Wow. Because they had to pay that anyway. And <laughs> the other thing about my job at the country club is they always fed us steak. We would go in at 4 o'clock, they'd give us a steak dinner. And I said to people, you know, you would never think that you would get tired of eating steak. But there was a long time in my life when I couldn't eat steak or hamburger because uh, I just had so much of it working there. But it was a great job. Now, as I recall, you had a pretty big extended family back in Philadelphia. Yes, was, yes. How did they react to you abandoning civilization and coming out into the middle of nowhere, I'm sure, is yeah. how they perceived it. Yes. Well, I, I was going to tell you the story. When I came here, my mother said to me, are you going to drive your car to Kansas? And I said, Mom, they don't have roads out there. It's all horses and, you know, I got to get a horse when I get out there. But I, there's no need for me to take my car. So I left my car. My brother wrecked it. And But when I got out here, it was just, you know. But the, 
go on with that story. My daughter, who was in the Peace Corps, she's in her 50s now. She graduated KU. When she had her first Peace Corps meeting, people still had the same conception of Kansas. Not that it was horse and buggy, but that, you know, there was very few roads out here. Like, you know, they were all from D.C., Baltimore, New York. People's conception of Kansas was still like the yellow brick road. Yeah. Now we're yeah. flyover country. Yeah, now we're so. flyover. Well, that was true <laughs> at one time also. Okay. Well, uh, so you finish your degree in Emporia, and then you wind up in Texas for yeah. a while. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. So I had a high draft number, and I didn't get drafted. And I said if I would stay in school or go into the military, whichever happened on my draft. And my draft number was very, very high. So I said, well, I'll just go on to school. And I got a scholarship down at, it was East Texas State University, subsequently it become Texas A&M University oh. of Commerce. Okay. So I went to school there. I ran a dorm, and I taught in psychology classes. And, you know, I got my Ph.D. from there, and they were very nice. They were, they, there was a lot of connection between Emporia and Texas. And people there had written, and Emporia had helped me go to Texas. I mean, they picked the school out for me. Oh. And then when I graduated from Texas, John Webb, who was a dean of students at Emporia, said, we got a job for you. Will you come back to Emporia? And you which, did. Which I did. And I stayed there until right, I, my first job in Kansas was the highway patrol was being sued for discriminating against women. And they needed a fair test. The old highway patrol test was sit-ups, push-ups. It was all physical endurance tests. And that disqualified all women. So they needed somebody to make tests, which I had a background in. At Emporia, I ran the every pupil testing program, which all the high school kids took these tests. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I came to Emporia, and I made the highway patrol test. I worked for Colonel Rush, Alan Rush. And uh, <coughs> then I did the sergeant test, lieutenant test, captain test. And they still use my tests, by the way. Wow. And I always was sorry I didn't get a copyright on those tests, so the state could have reimbursed me for using them all these years. But that was how I got started in Topeka. And then Jim James called me, and they said, we're unifying the courts, and there's no personnel director here, and we don't know, and we don't have any, we have to assume, I think, 3, 000, uh, 1,500 or 2,000 employees put them under one system, would you be interested in coming over here and helping us do that? So I said I would do that, and I came over to the court system, and I start to put together the, the plan to assume 110 courts in 105 counties. And that was a very interesting job. I traveled all around. We audited jobs. It was me and two other people who did all this. And uh, we did that and presented that. And that was a major sea change was. in, because prior to that time, each of the counties and, and, and judicial district districts were kind of like a little island, yeah. self governing yes. island. Yes. Really, yeah. and, and what. What reaction? Well, let's let's talk about then. You became the successor to Jim James. Right. Talk about how that happened. Well, to assume, I'm going to go back to your what you were going to ask me about some of the problems that we encounter. Right. Wichita, Johnson County, and to a degree Shawnee County paid their employees a lot more than rural counties, and there was a big discrepancy for people who did the same job being paid at differential rates. So we put that all together, and there was a lot of controversy surrounded that. And they, the legislature had the post auditor look at what we had done. And the post auditor said that there was, out of the, I don't know, 2,000 employees that we assumed, they said that there were 35 employees that we snuck in the system somehow, which did not turn out to be true. 
some of them were temporary employees. I mean, there was an understanding, but it did cause a sea change because I don't think the legislature realized how much this was going to cost. I think it was, when it was first presented to the legislature, it was vastly understated, the cost of assuming all the judges in the state and all the non-judicial employees in the state. But we got that done. And when I was here, I got to tell this story right. <laughs> the, the budget, the chief had asked me to take a look at the budget because I had budgeting experience. And I looked at the budget and I said, Chief, if you go over to the legislature with this budget, you're going to have nothing but problems. It, it doesn't, it's not correct. And he kind of got a little upset with me for saying that. I said, they're, when you get in front of ways and means, they're going to have a difficult time with that budget. And that's exactly what happened. And so after that, when Jim had a better offer with the National Center for State Courts so that I was the most experienced person in the building. And you'd been doing it how long? i have been doing it just one, <laughs> one year, year. All going on two years, I guess, <laughs> a year and a half. I was the most experienced person here. And the chief came to me, Schrader, it was Alfred Schrader, and he said, Howard, you have to be a lawyer to hold this job. If you can get the legislature to change the requirement that a Ph.D., would be equivalent to a law degree. You, we want you to be our administrator. So I, you know, I we did. I got the law changed, and they then they hired me. I was acting for about a year, year and a half, and then we got that law changed through the legislature. And that set, was... then I worked for seven chief justices, any of which could fire me at any time without cause, and so. Well, let's get back to that issue about court unification. Were there a lot of uh, judges out in the hinterlands who were uh, objected to this yes. or were very difficult to deal yes. with? I, mean, yes. I don't need names, but just no. uh, yes. uh, talk about the difficulties of implementing unification. It, it, was, it was a change, number one. And judges are pretty conservative and Ooh. not really in favor of a lot of change. And this was a sea change. And think about the judges who hired the clerks in their offices. Now Topeka, they see, assumed Topeka was going to take all that power away from them and tell them who they had to hire. It was just unsettling, except in your more urban courts, where they weren't involved in any way. They had court administrators who did all the administrative work. But in maybe a 95 counties, it was the judge that was the king. And some of that power is being taken away from the judge. You know, what the big problem was, when the Supreme Court assumed authority for the district court, it that was, was just, a, it wasn't was a, that a constitutional amendment? It was a constitutional right. amendment. And it just created big changes in the system. Because the Supreme Court said, now we're responsible. If things happen that are adverse, it's not the judge that will be held responsible. It will be us that are held responsible. So there was an attitude change among the Supreme Court. They wanted to take, they took this very seriously that they were now in charge. And they wanted things done right, which if I could get into a little bit about the bi the biggest change that we made sure. right away, which I think kind of upset people the most, but settled things down the most. We were looking, we had judges now sending us to, sending to us in Topeka case filings. So we could track cases in the district court. And we noticed at reviewing this that most cases took a long time to go through our courts. Now, a lot of the courts at that time when I came over, they weren't air conditioned. There was no summer court. Summer, they would recess for the summer and wait till the fall. But cases would kind of stack up. And it just seemed to us that it took a long time. So one day we were sitting around looking at cases, and there was a, a civil case that it was going on four or five years. And someone made the comment to me 
that, you know, it shouldn't take longer for a case to go through our court system than it did for the United States to enter, fight, and win World War II. We ought to have some kind of standard that says, you know, long enough is long enough. Why should it take this long? So we started asking attorneys. We did a survey, and we asked attorneys, well, how long should a domestic case take? And they said, well, it should only take about six months, but it takes a year. It'll take us a year. So what we did, then we did a survey. How long does it take a domestic case to go through the Kansas courts? And invariably, it would come back a year. And we would say, how long should it take? And the attorney would say six months. But what we realized was that the attorneys controlled the docket. And the attorneys, since they controlled the docket, the judges would pace themselves according to the speed that the attorneys worked at. So a litigant would come in who was seeking a divorce, let's say, and the, and the attorney would say, this is going to take a year. And they would pace themselves for a year. But they would know they could get this done in six months. So the big change that we took that both unsettled the system but settled the system is we told judges that they had to be in charge of the dockets, not the attorneys. That was a sea change of philosophy, not only in Kansas, which Kansas was the first state to do this, and other states followed our lead, and uh, we got all kinds of awards for doing this from around the nation. But it, it, it was just judges didn't, a lot of judges didn't want to take control of the docket. You know, that's not the way the system had ever worked before. So th these were really monumental changes. But the court took this very seriously, and they said the judge was going to be in charge of the case. Now, it took a long time to implement these changes, and really what we did was we waited for judges who came on the bench after their kids were out of college, and they took it as kind of a, a retirement job. And now we're saying you're going to have to work full time and you're going to have to, you're going to have to meet these standards that we've established and we're going to watch. And if you don't meet these standards, we're going to ask you why is he, why you're going to have to write a report to us telling us why it's taking this long for a case to go through your court. That was really tremendous change. The rumor was you had a hit list uh, of, the, old, have, yeah. of the oldest cases, and we uh, no it. judge wanted to be on that hit list. We published it. <laughs> we sent it out to everybody. The 10 oldest cases in the state of Kansas. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, wasn't, it, yeah. wasn't it if you were on that list, you yeah. could expect a call from yes. your departmental yeah. justice yes. saying, uh, yes. please yes. explain yeah. Uh, yeah. this case to yeah. me? Yeah. And I always said, if they're... If, there was a case on there from a certain judge. It was only on there once. Now, there may be other cases that judge had show up, but he would take care of that particular case. <laughs> Did you get a lot of uh, pushback from yes. judges on yes. that? Yes. Well, because the judges, the attorneys, it was the pushback really from the attorneys that was the hardest. They pushed the judges. They didn't want the judges to be in charge. They wanted to be in charge of the pace of litigation in the courts. They didn't think the judges should be in charge of the pace of litigation. So the, most, of the, most of it came from the bar. But then, you know, over time, we forged a closer relation, working relationship with the bar, which we hadn't had to that point. Okay, so unification was a, a struggle that you uh, uh, got your way through. Case management was a struggle. Um, you had some other major changes, like the whole child support system was essentially uh, restructured. Yes. Talk about you that. You know, all of this to me is evolutionary based upon the courts working under the Supreme Court. It, it wasn't, these were not not isolated things that happened. These were things that evolved over a period of time. So the next big change was child support. And I give myself a lot of credit for the child support. That's the one thing. I would raise two girls by myself. And it always amazed me how much it cost.
to raise girls. When I would go out to buy shoes for them or clothing for them or pay for their school, I, it was just, I just didn't realize how much it cost to raise a child. Women knew, but men didn't. And it seemed to us that the, the amounts of awards that judges gave in terms of child support was wildly different from judge to judge, county to county, district to district. There was no uniformity in how much similar circumstances for a divorcing parent could receive. It depended really who the judge was and where you lived. Absolutely. And we wanted to put an end to that. We wanted to have a standard that no matter where you lived in Kansas, giving the circumstances of a divorce, this is how much each child would be paid on a monthly basis. So we did, we established that through a committee of judges and attorneys. It took us a year. Judge Walton from Johnson County, who was the child expert in Kansas, he chaired that committee. And to this day, that committee meets on a regular basis to update those guidelines. But we were also one of the first states to have guidelines that a judge could go to and say, okay, under the circumstances of the case, this is what it's recommended for you to pay in child support. And am I not correct? It was based on some scientific evidence of what it actually costs to raise a child, not just, oh, let's set the figure at this. I mean, it it, it was cost-based after some uh, uh, economic studies. It's true. It was cost-based, whereas the time standards were more feelies, you know? <laughs> we just thought, everybody said, well, this is how much time that ought to take. But when we did child support, we had economic, We had two economists, one from K-State, one from KU that were on the committee. We had a lot of input from a variety of, it wasn't just judges and lawyers making these decisions. It was a very diverse committee. I imagine there was some pushback on that too when it first started. Uh, judges were used to just st- yeah. having a schedule and, and living by it. Yeah. Now they actually had to get out uh, yeah. uh, a calculator and yeah. do some figures. Yeah. So was there some pushback on that? A lot that? of pushback. But these things are evolutionary. Now it's a matter of routine, right? Yeah. I mean, they know the judges now know this is the way it, this is the way it works. Well, there's a computer yeah. program. Yeah. I'll do it for yeah. you, too. Yeah. That yeah. helps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Now, you worked under seven different chief justices. Were some of them uh, much more hands-on as far as their desire to know detail and deal with the legislature, and some more hands-off, saying, Howard, you take care of it? They were all hands-off. They, they became judges because they liked to hear cases and write opinions. And we would, I would meet with the justices on at least a monthly basis, and I'd bring all the administrative questions we had or things that I needed for them to vote on. And they would actually get hostile about, they said, I didn't get this job to be an administrator. That's what, you, that's what we have you for. So, and not until really Justice Nuss. And he's the first justice that was really interested, I think. And his court was more interested. They were younger judges at the time. They were the last of the change. And I think we got four new justices at that time. And they were more interested in the administration of the court. Then the other justices were really more interested in writing opinions and hearing cases. That was their main focus. Well, the upshot was you got to be the lightning rod on a lot of things with the legislature and the yeah. district courts. Yeah. And, and uh, you had to take a lot of that on your back that uh, maybe other places didn't have to. As you talk yeah. to your peers around the country, was your role fairly unique or... Uh, or I was a longing service, service administrator in the country. But, it, yeah. but as far as how much rope yes. the, the, the justices yeah. would normally give you, did you feel like you had more independence in your role than maybe some others did? I felt that the, our system in Kansas was a good system of the way we nominated judges and how judges got to the Court of Appeals and to the Supreme Court. In many states, justices were elected. 
Yeah. And they just brought over their election staff, people who ran their staff. So when there would be an election, I, t I tell the story one time, the Texas judge, the Supreme Court Chief Justice in Texas, had approached me about going to work in Texas because they knew I went to school there. And he said to me, here's how it'll work. Every day, I spend the first three hours in my chambers making telephone calls to solicit donations for my campaign. And then I administered the court system. And I said, I don't want to work under a system like that. But that's how most of the, where they still elected judges, which was in half the state still, and the Supreme Court. They spent most of their time, when the staff changed, the administrators changed when the chief changed. And they would always bring their own staff on board. Now, you served with seven chief justices, but I think you had kind of a special relationship with Chief Justice McFarland. Why don't, we, why don't okay. you talk a little bit about... Uh, your work with her and uh, and and how uh, that uh, led into some other things uh, uh, with her uh, off the bench. Okay. When she became the chief, I knew it was. I was worried that it was going to be kind of difficult because I felt like she number one had a reputation that wasn't true. Uh, she she really broke so many glass ceilings in this state. You had to know her as long as I did. When she first came on the Supreme Court, she was shunned by the other justices. Wow. Where they would go out and have lunch together, she was never invited. Where they would play cards or dominoes, she wasn't invited. I think that uh, the men at that time, my first being on the court, although Chief Justice Schrader was different, and he did, he did like her and he did support her. But the other justices, who will remain unnamed, they just weren't used to having a woman. And they didn't think a woman's role was to be a judge. And you think that she was the first district court judge that was a female. Right. She was the first justice that was a female. In fact, when she was called by Governor Docking, the set, not the, uh, Bennett, Bennett appointed yeah. her. Yeah. When she was called by Governor Bennett, she thought it was a hoax. <laughs> I mean, she didn't believe it. And she showed up at Governor Bennett's office first thing in the morning to find out if it was true. And it was true. Uh, but it was having her on the court. It was, you know, we all knew things were going to change. When she became chief, she really exerted herself. Where the other chiefs were mostly interested in the judging aspect of it and judges. We always wanted more judges. We always wanted higher salaries for judges. We felt that they were underpaid and compared to attorneys. And we wanted the highest quality of attorneys to be on the bench. She came in, and she was for non-judicial employees. She always referred to it as the court family. And none of the, you know, it struck me that none of the other just chiefs that I worked for had ever really used that term, court family. But she saw this as a family. And that was such a different orientation for the whole system. She was a wonderful storyteller, by the way. And uh, I, I think that, you know, I think of the, the legacy of some of the justices. Uh, Justice Schroeder put this system together, Alfred Schroeder. He put this system together. In t turbulent times, he stuck up for the court system. He went to fight with the legislature. You know, uh, he was after Judge Fotzer who was responsible for this building being built, getting this money. He was a former legislator, Fotzer. So he took the brunt of putting the system together. When Justice Holmes came on board, he was a worker, and he expected judges to work. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He'd work on a Saturday. He'd work on a Sunday. He expected everybody to work as hard as he did, and he made no bones about it. And when he talked, 
to the judges at the judge conference, that was always one of his messages. You need to put the time in. You need to do the work. You need to be good stewards of the system. So that's what he was known for. Justice Mel Prager was also, he was a really good writer, Justice Prager. Yes, he was. He, he was very well liked. He brought unity to the court. He went around. He was the first justice that really traveled from point A to point B. I mean, the justices early on wouldn't even go to their judicial departments. But as new justices came on, they again, every time I felt we had a change of justice, they, they would accept more responsibility for managing the system, at least managing their departments. And they'd want to manage their departments. And that evolved over time also. Uh, Justice McFarland, she... I just think everybody liked Justice McFarland. Once they got to know her, and I think she did a good job with the legislature. She was in... Legislature was cutting... It was hard times. Budgets were being reduced all over. And... She just got along well with everybody. And when she, uh, I think this is correct, when she passed, there really was no family uh, available, and you helped kind of settle her right. affairs, as yeah. I yeah. understand it. Uh, I would go over to her house in the summertime, and I would throw, she had so much, she kept everything. I would just toss everything. <laughs> and so when it came time to handling her affairs, she went to my wife, Elaine, and she said, you value what I have. Your husband doesn't value. He tosses what I have. He throws it away. Would you handle my estate for me? And she left. She said, I want my estate to go to the zoo in Topeka and to the people of Topeka and the state of Kansas. So one of the things we built, Kay's Garden, and I would encourage anybody who comes to Topeka to go to Topeka Zoo and see and view Kay's Garden. It's magnificent. It's going to be named one of the 10 best gardens in the United States. Wow. It, it's Fantastic. just, it's fabulous. The zoo has done so good. But one of the other things that Justice McFarland wanted to do was give something back to people, a legacy. Because she didn't have a family when she passed. All Her family had all passed. And... We, Elaine wanted to leave her legacy, and you can read about Chief Justice McFarling on LastingLegacy.com. Her story is there. She's been an inspiration to so many women, so many girls. When she passed, I can't tell you the number of girls or women that came up and said, when I was a little girl and I loved horses, Kay McFarland would invite me out her farm so I could see her horses. She would let me ride her horses. She told me I could do whatever I wanted to do. Nobody else ever said that to me. Well, wow. I mean, I get choked up just thinking about that. She was such an inspiration to women. And I wish people would go on to her, read her story on Lasting Legacy, dot lastinglegacy.org and read it's a free it, it it's inspirational your story's on there too my story's on there too and it's a good read yes, it's, it's a, a good thank read, you so. thank you um two or three things we need to wrap up here before too long uh, that I'd, I'd like you to to comment on and one of them is kind of the evolving relationship that you've seen between the legislature and the, uh, well, uh, between the three branches of government, really, but particularly between, from those early rocky days with the legislature and court unification and then wanting to take the, the Supreme Court to take leadership, but then kind of glunching and moaning when, uh, when they d actually did that. What's, but you saw it for 32 years. How would you describe the relationship with the, of the judicial branch with other branches of government? It, to me, it's always a struggle of power. The court and the legislature and the executive branch. And I'll, I'll start with the executive branch. Child support. The executive branch thought that they should be responsible in every way for child support. 
where the court, the, the judges that decided divorces, how much alimony. So it was a shared relationship. But in the legislature, the same thing. Someone once said there's always a balance of power between the three branches of government. It's never stable. Sometimes the legislature holds the power. Sometimes the judicial branch holds the power, particularly through its decision making. For example, school finance. Sometimes the executive branch holds the power, and they did in the beginning through budget. Our budget had to go through the executive branch, and they wouldn't pass our budget through. So it was a constant struggle of trying to maintain an equity of balance. Now, I think that has changed to a degree that those power struggles are still there, but we, work, we know we have to work much more closely with the legislature. And we know we have to work more closely with the executive branch. We can't be at war with them as we were in the early days. And we were. We were all constantly at war with the legislature. But, you know, I think that we're more sensitive now to the financial status of the state. And we just yes. can't expect money to be given to us unless we can really demonstrate a need for that money or a need for new personnel. And I think once we learn that lesson, the legislature has been more generous to us. But it's always going to be a balance of power. Let's focus in now on just the judicial branch uh, itself, because you've been on the front line of a lot of the most important changes that have occurred uh, in the last century uh, in uh, Kansas uh, judiciary. Uh, it, one of the things I've observed is the judiciary is being called on to deal with more and more hot button issues that society doesn't know how else to resolve. Uh, that you know the legislature can't resolve things, so somebody sues somebody yeah. else. Uh, somebody doesn't get what they want. They, the court system seems to me is is having to deal with a lot of societal issues that it's not really designed to. Do you want to have any thoughts on that? Life is more complex, <laughs> and you know it's. <laughs> It's sometimes the court is the court of last resort. And people will say, you know, we can't figure it out. Let's go to the court. Yeah. You know? And uh, the and court. that court really isn't designed to. Uh, right. Because courts have a, a lot of trouble adjudicating feelings. Yes. <laughs> exactly. 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 You, you know, you can decide yes or no, yeah. Yeah. overruled or not, guilty yeah. or not guilty. Yeah. But telling somebody yeah. how you should feel about something, yeah. that's, but, that, but that court seems to me are yeah. very inclusively yeah. being called on, on to do that. So. But again, isn't it just the evolution of our society and oh. the, the legislature has certainly evolved, the executive has certainly evolved. It's just where we are as a society and what society expects from their institutions. So is it going to continue on down that path? Absolutely. What's your, what does your crystal ball tell you? Absolutely, Howard? it's going to continue down that path. Okay. Let's and it's a good thing we have a court system to resolve disputes. You know, we don't have to take guns or fighting. We can go to a court and have our disputes resolved peacefully. Except then they attack the judges if they don't like yeah, the, well, the outcome. I, it I, goes with the job. Yeah, right? yeah it does. Yeah. That's true. Talk about... You've been retired for a while now. You've gotten to see the world through a different lens. And uh, what's uh, what kinds of things is Howard, are important in Howard, Howard Schwartz's life right now? When I retired, Kay McFarland said to me, you know that alarm clock you got in your house? Kick it out the window <laughs> and don't pay attention to it anymore. Being re I like being retired. My wife keeps me busy. Uh, and you had grandkids, yeah, great grandkids, great grandkids, grandkids, great grandkids. Uh, life is good. Okay. And you know, I I still have all my friends from the court system. I still see them. I have lunch with them. We get together. So life is good. Uh, there's a question I always like to ask because you I read somewhere you try to read a book a week. Yes. What's on your nightstand? What do you? Uh, read? I'm reading. Uh, Right now, I'm, I'm going back through some Gray Man, the Gray Man series. Oh, okay. And uh, I just like to read. You know, I've always liked to read. 
Because when I, when I was working in Delcatessen and wasn't busy, I just read books. So I've always been a, a reader. But I, I do have some advice for people that made, what made me successful. I, wish, I want to like to tell you what made me successful. All right. We'd like to know. I always hired people who were smarter than I was. And if you would follow that's hard that, to believe, Howard. No, no, no. If you would follow that rule, you'll be successful. Just try to find people who are smarter than you and let them do their jobs. Does that go with marriage too? Does that yeah, yeah to marriage? I got a good wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Howard, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank um, you so much, and, Judge. And you know, I, I, having been a judge through almost, well, I think almost your entire career. Uh, you have kept the ship of uh, the judiciary steady at times when it would have been very easily for it to founder. Well, I was lucky that I dealt with judges like yourself. Well, you. you were a good judge to deal with. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, the Mutual Admiration Society will adjourn now. And uh, thank you so much. This has been great. appreciate it. And I know we've uh, shared some things that people might not know about. And I uh, appreciate I your so. time. So. Thank you. Thank you.